The month of April, we would, uh, started looking at John chapter 11, and uh, the theme is the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life. And when you read John chapter 11, you will see the story of how that Lazarus was dead and Jesus was sent for and he came four days later. Um, Lazarus had been buried. All hope was lost. It was as if nothing was going to happen again. Matter believed the Lord could do something, but believed that the Lord had come late. So if you had come at the right time, maybe my brother would not have died. And Jesus answered Martha saying, it didn't matter that I wasn't around when your brother died. I'm here to reveal myself as the resurrection and the life, not a life, the life. I am the resurrection. I am the life. So Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and asked that the stone be rolled away. And the Bible says he lifted up his voice and called Lazarus forth. And the Bible says it was he that was dead that came forth. And we began to uh, draw the revelation from that scripture that beyond the immediate story, uh, the life and times and acts of Jesus communicated something deeper than what was happening in the immediate. You know, for instance, when you look at the story of Jonah, his disobedience, his journey to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. He's being thrown into the belly of the deep. He's being swallowed by the fish. He's being released on the third day. Uh, for those who saw those happenings, they would have felt like, oh, fantastic. That's something great. He was in the belly of the fish for three days. He came up miraculous. But the real import of what was happening many generations before Jesus came was that Jesus was painting with the life of Jonah. Even in his disobedience, he was working all things together to paint a narrative of the resurrection. That he will be dead and buried for three days. And in the same way that Jonah came forth from the belly of the fish after three days, he would be resurrected. So when a generation began to ask him for sign, he said, this adulterous generation that is always looking for a sign, there is no other sign that will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As he was in the belly of the fish for three days, that's the way the Son of Man will be there and will come. So many times you need to read the Bible deeply to see that what is being communicated is more than what is happening on the surface. You know, that's why the Bible says the letter kill it. It is the spirit that quickens. And the words that I speak to you, they are not tell tales. They are not stories. This is not Mickey Mouse. This is not history. As historical as the Bible is, the content of it is more prophetic than historic. The things that Jesus is communicating to us as the logos, as the word of God, they are deeper than the letters. So in the story of Lazarus, the context of all that was happening to Lazarus was not that Jesus wanted to make a show of, he was that Jesus wanted to reveal himself as something that he had not been known as, the resurrection and the life. He had raised a lot of people and did not reveal himself by that name, right? He had raised people. But in the resurrection or the raising of Lazarus, it was important that he taught us his identity as the one who has the capacity to resurrect people and give them life. So he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believes in me will not die. Right? So that's important. Now, in the previous three lessons, we really broke down the implication of who Lazarus was, a friend of God, um, as a picture of the first Adam, how the first Adam died. And the Bible says it was four days after he had died that Jesus came. And when you read the Bible, I, I studied a bit of the historicity of the story. The Bible says Jesus came in the fullness of time. And it was 4,000 years from Adam to Jesus. Just like Jesus came four days after Lazarus had died. And what he came to do 
for us is to reveal himself as the resurrection and the life. So he came to wake us up from the dead. And that's how we got to what I call the resurrected life. So the old life of Lazarus was done with what Jesus gave to him was the newness of life. In the same day, when a man gives his life to Christ or takes the life of Christ, he comes into an economy of new life. You know, Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. Ephesians also Paul talked about how that we should walk in the newness of life. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. When a man is born again, he is in a new economy. He has entered into the kingdom of God and he has the life of God in him. So you may want to catch up on the previous lessons. If you didn't, it's going to really bless you. So we are called to live what I call the resurrected life. This is the life of God. The resurrected life, like I said last week, is an empowered life. The resurrected life is a quickened life. It's a life that is sponsored by the Spirit of God on the inside of man. It's a victorious life. It encompasses all of what God has done for us in Christ. So we, we have that life as a gift. The Bible says the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it in abundance. So it is abundant life. And again the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So you see, this life is a gift. The resurrected life is a gift. You are gifted the resurrected life. Every believer already has the resurrected life. In the resurrected life is the perfection of all that Jesus has done for us. Jesus has saved us. Jesus has healed us. Jesus has perfected us. Jesus has delivered us. Jesus has sanctified us, right? We are already perfect in that life. So well, while you're on earth, what you need to do is to begin to experience the reality of that life. Okay? To experience the reality of that life. So, uh, at the end of John chapter 11, Jesus had caused Lazarus to come out from the grave. He was bound. Then Jesus said, lose him and let him go. God wants you to go into the world and manifest and enjoy the resurrected life. You are set free from the bondage of the law. You are set free from the bondage of sin. You are set free from every bondage of the enemy, from the shackles of the enemy. Lose him and let him go. The resurrected life is a life of liberty. You are liberty as a citizen of God's kingdom to enjoy the fullest expression of the life of God without any inhibitions. You are restored back to dominion. Right? That's the resurrected life. Now the question is, how do I enjoy the resurrected life? What I'm going to be focusing on this morning is how to grow and enjoy the resurrected life. John chapter 12, I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 2. John chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 2. Six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus, so recently raised from the dead, was living. Lazarus and his sisters invited Jesus to dinner at their home. Martha said, Lazarus was one of those sitting at the table with them. Now the Bible says Jesus came six days before Passover into Bethany, and it was the place where Lazarus, the person that had just been raised from the dead, was living. His sisters and himself invited Jesus to dinner in their home, and it was Martha that was serving. And the Bible says Lazarus, uh, it's important to pay attention to that. The one that was dead and incapacitated had been given the newness of life and was now in a position where he could sit at the table with the Savior. I want you to pay attention to the posture because what I'm going to be talking about this morning is the believer's posture in resurrection. The believer's posture in resurrection. The Bible says Lazarus was one of those that was sitting at the table with him. 
it is not everywhere you see Jesus uh, sitting with people at the table. So even the sitting of Jesus at the table and the inclusion of Lazarus at the table with Jesus is instructive and revelational. You see, when a man is raised up from the dead, the, the old life, you know, the Bible talks about you being dead in your sins. So when Jesus comes and you take the life of Jesus, you are resurrected from the position of dead. The first portion that you must take in the kingdom is to sit. That's important. And it's important to understand this posture because if you don't get the progression of this posture in Christ, you will not be able to maximize the resurrected life. Lazarus was seated at the table to eat with Jesus. This is important. The first posture of the resurrected life is to be seated with Christ in victory. To be seated with Christ in victory. This is important. You've got to take a position of sitting. You've got to come. This is the table of Christ. It's a place where you have communion. It's a place where you have fellowship with Christ. It's a place where you have access with Christ. Let, let, let me take you to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 to verse 6. I'm going to read the Amplified Classic. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 5 to verse 6. He said, Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace that you are saved, that is delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation and he raised us up together with him and what did he make us to do and made us sit down together giving us joint seating with Christ he made us to sit down together in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus the Messiah the anointed one so the first portion that you take as a believer in the kingdom is a sitting portion in every places in Christ Jesus. This is important. And so much as this is a position given to you by grace, you did not do anything to earn it. You've got to understand it to be able to maximize it. Your portion and position in Christ must be understood so that you can maximize. So when Jesus resurrected, you were factored into that equation and you resurrected with him. And you were taken into heavenly places so that you could sit with Christ in heavenly places. You must not forget that in the first Adam, there was a fall. And that fall was a fall from glory. It was a fall from access because it was chased out of the Garden of Eden. It was a fall from a position of dominion that the original Adam occupied. So in the resurrected life, the moment you gave your life to Christ, you are factored into Christ and you are raised to sit with Christ. So in John chapter 12, the Bible says, Lazarus was at the table sitting with Jesus. I found one of those interesting stories in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 to verse 13. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 to verse 13. The Bible says there was a grandson of the king Saul by the name Mephibosheth. He was a son of Jonathan. And now that uh, Saul, a prototype of the first Adam also, had lost out the kingdom, David was now on the throne. And then the Bible says one day, uh, David began to ask question, who is in the house of Saul that I could bless for Jonathan's sake? The reason why I'm going to bless this person is not because I know him, it's not so much because he has done anything, you know, to uh, be able to enjoy my good heartedness. I'm going to be doing whatever I'm doing for this person because of Jonathan. That's also a picture of salvation and substitution. The reason why God is blessing us, why God is giving us access to his table, is not because of anything we have done. It is because of the goodness of Jesus. You remember the goodness of Jonathan to David. 
Jonathan paid the price. Jonathan gave up his possibility of becoming the next king. Jonathan uh, gave David tips when Saul was looking to kill him. So it was all about the goodness of Jonathan, the works of Jonathan, the friendship of Jonathan. This was the reason why anybody in the house of Saul, right, who was not qualified for any blessing from David, because Saul persecuted David all the days of his life. But the reason why anyone was going to have access to the blessings of David was because of the work of Jonathan, and Jonathan had died. So, uh, Mephibosheth was brought into the picture. And he was told David that there was a son, Mephibosheth. This guy was not worth sitting in the king's palace, not to talk of sitting in the king's table. The Bible says he was handicapped in his feet, right? But because of what Jonathan did, every shot coming in Mephibosheth was going to be overlooked. This is what Jesus did for us. Because of what Jesus has done, God is going to look away from your sin. He said, I will not remember your sin. I will not remember your iniquity. It is not because of you. It is because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done on your behalf, paid the price, even though your shortcomings are still visible and God is not blind, he can see all things, he knows all things, but he says he will deliberately overlook your shortcomings and invite you to be seated at his table. So the Holy God was going to allow uh, an handicapped Mephibosheth like us with all our infirmities still intact, but he's going to place us in Jesus so that we can have access to his table. Hallelujah. It's such a beautiful story, wonderful story of grace, wonderful story of love. So the first thing here, Mephibosheth was invited out of Lodibar and he began to sit in the king's palace, sit at the king's table. And let's talk about the implication of sitting. The implication of sitting, the, the position of sitting, first and foremost, is a position of rest. One of the difference, one of the differences between the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant is that the Old Covenant puts you to walk. The New Covenant puts you at rest. The, the New Covenant starts with not you doing, but you resting on what has already been done. So accurate and true Christianity does not start with you doing something. It starts with something that has been done. So we come to sit at the table to eat of what has been prepared, not by you, not of works, lest any man should boast. The reason why you have a seat at that table is not because you paid a ticket, it is because Jesus paid the price so that you could have access to the table of God. So Mephibosheth had a place at the table, Lazarus had a place at the table because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. So you are the rest. You know, Jesus said in Matthew, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest. Sitting, have you ever been tired? Maybe you've been all out there walking through the day, and then you come back into your house and you fall on your couch and you sit and give a sigh of relief. It's a position of rest. I will give you rest. So Jesus ascended into the heavens took a seat at the right hand of the Father, and he said all is done, all is finished. He had finished from all his work and now he's resting. You also in him, you are granted rest. He gives us rest. So sitting is a position of rest. That's the first implication of sitting. The second implication of sitting is access. We have access when we are seated at the table in Christ and with God. We have access. This covenant, the new covenant, is a covenant of access. It's a covenant of intimacy. We are not strangers. We are members of the family. One of the great places where families can bond together is the culture of eating together. When we sit at the table as a family to eat, everybody is present. It's a place where we bond as a family. It's the same nutrient that flows at the table. Everybody is eating the same thing. So the health condition of everybody is conditioned by what is on that table. So it is a place of rest 
It's a place of access. It's a place of the release of the energy. The energy that is at work on that table is determined by what is served, the menu. So when you have access to the table of God, it is what is served at that table, right, that determines your strength. So you have the energy of the family. What flows in God is what flows in us because we have access to the table. So the believer must understand his sitting position. Many a times we try to jump and run immediately and that's why we stumble and make a mess a lot of times because we have not yet maximized the sitting position and then we want to stand and then we want to walk. There is no baby that starts walking the day he was born. You must start from sitting. You start from sitting, so you have access. It's at the table that we can look into the eyes of the Father. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, everybody that has access to this table, can have access to behold us in a glass the glory of the Lord. And we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Mephibosheth. Maybe he was hungry in Lodabar. He didn't have access to good food in Lodabar. Now that he was brought into the economy of the king's table, he eats the same food that the king eats. As he sits at that table, his legs that had issues are going to be healed because the anointing that flows at the table has an healing function that can raise up the cripple. When we come to the table, that's the place where we have access to the fullness of the vitality of the life of God. We behold, we behold as in the glass, with open face. In the Old Testament, they did not have access to sit at the table. They did not have access. When you read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you will see that the people in the Old Testament couldn't access the fading glory that was in the face of Moses. Even though our current glory, which is the New Testament glory, is far, far greater than the Old Testament glory, but the weight of the glory that was manifested in the face of Moses was scary such that he had to cover it with a veil. And the implication of covering his face with a veil and restricting the access of the people to the glory was that they could not enter into the economy of the life of that testament because they were shut out from the glory of it. And when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, He has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not like the old, where the people's heart was covered with a veil. Here we have access, we behold, we all, with open face, behold as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Jesus is the brightness of that glory. And you are already placed in Him. And by your access at that table, to be able to behold the glory, you have access to transformation. He said, we are being transformed. We are being changed into the same image. That's why looking is important in this kingdom. Revelation is important in this kingdom. Intimacy is important in this kingdom. Access. You cannot be going to God through another man. As important as your man of God is, He's supposed to help you to be able to maximize your own personal liberty, your own personal access to God. You cannot stay behind the scene for somebody to see God on your behalf. It means that you have limited your growth because your growth in this kingdom is maximized first and foremost by your access to the kingdom of glory. And in Christ, we have been given that access. So we have rest. We have access, we are feeding, feeding at the table. In the place where you are seated, that's where you have access to the feeding. The economy of food that is served at that table, the knowledge, food here is speaking of knowledge. And that's what determines the quality of life. You know, in First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, the New International Version, the Bible says, like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. So there is growth in your salvation. It's not enough to say, I've gotten admission to the university. There is growth, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18, that part of the just is as a shining light. It is brighter and brighter. It's from glory to glory. It's from one level to another level. 
So when you sit at the table, you crave pure spiritual milk. I love this particular version because it says pure spiritual milk. What makes for growth in this kingdom is not jokes. And can I take a moment to speak about that? A lot of us have been victims of jumps, and when we look back today, we just thank God for His mercies because despite it all, He has granted us grace to be able to grow. But we would have grown greater, we would have done better if we had access to the pure spiritual milk. When you talk of pure spiritual milk, you are talking about an understanding and a knowledge of the things of God, not the things of men. Many of what was taught for many years of our Christianity was the mundane, the things of man, success principles, greatness principles, prosperity principles, keys here and there. And when you look back at five, ten years of your Christian experience, you find out, looking at your notes, that you were not taught Christ. You were not taught spiritual things. You were taught mundane things. You are taught things that did not do anything to your spiritual growth. When you look at the mileage you covered, you, you stumbled upon a, a few things here and there, but there was no mastery. What you were given was not pure spirituality. When it comes to feeding in this kingdom, to have the quality of eternal life that you're supposed to have, you must be fed with pure spiritual milk. And I want to encourage everyone that comes across this, that it's important that you also be deliberate in seeking out pure spiritual milk. Don't settle for jobs. At the end of the day, it does you no good. It is not advantageous to your life to have been fed or to be fed with junk five, ten years of your Christian life. You have no roots. You can't, you can't say you have spiritual growth. I mean, it's a waste of time. How can you be a Christian and you don't understand the fundamental doctrines of salvation? The things that you share with God in Christ. You don't understand your liberty. You don't understand the law, the texture of the law, the regime of the law that you operate on. You don't understand the workings of the Spirit, the communications of the Spirit. You don't understand. I mean, there is so much to know. But if what is communicated to you is jumped, you're going to know five keys to prosperity, two keys to success. This is not London Business School. This is not Lagos Business School. This is not a school of success as, as much as important as that is. The church is a place where we learn Christ. It's a place where we learn Christ. It's a place of spiritual knowledge. When you read Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15, this was what God was talking about to Jeremiah. He said, then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So in the kingdom, what we are fed with is knowledge and understanding in the ways of God, in the workings of God. This is why good teaching ministry, a teaching priest and discipleship is key to the believer's life. The quality of believers we raise cannot be greater than the quality of teachers and teaching ministry. This is important. So what God wants to give is shepherds after his own heart who will feed the people, the people of God, with knowledge and understanding. There are things to know, depths and depths and depths of things to know in Christ. There are revelations of Christ that the average believer needs to know for him to come into the fullness of the economy of the resurrected life. For him to be able to maximize. So there is a sitting position. The sitting position uh, guarantees you access to the economy of divine knowledge so that you can know. You know the Bible talks about you having no need that any man to, should teach you because the anointing that is upon you is able to teach you all things. Before you get to the point where the anointing upon you is activated to begin to personally teach you, the first economy of life demands that you first be fed. You grow up as an adult and come to a place where you no longer need your parents to teach you what to do and what not to do. But when you were born and you started growing up, you first needed teachers. So the first thing that the anointing that's upon you does is that it gravitates you to your teachers who will be able to teach you. So that you come up to the place where the anointing that's upon you can now teach you all things. There are things by the grace of God that I was not taught by any man. I was taught by the Holy Ghost. 
And then to, for you to come into the validation of the things that the Holy Spirit has taught you, you will see other people in the kingdom who have also entered into those classes in the spirit. They will be speaking of the things that you were taught in the secret. So for you to know, uh, in a, you are very personal. That teaching was personal. But the truth about it is that the syllabus is not personal. What you are being taught by God in the secret, there are other people who are not with you physically, but they are with you in the spirit in the same class. So they will have access to those things. So the things that are revealed, uh, that's why the Bible says there is no, the scripture is not of private interpretation. The things of God also, as exclusive as they can be, they are given to God's children everywhere that report to class. So when you come to the place of city, it's a place of learning. I want to encourage that the believer, every believer must understand that teaching is important. Teaching is important. So God raised up Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That right hand is not right and left like this. He speaks of a position of authority. He speaks of a position of dominion. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. That he walked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. It's a sitting position of authority. The Bible talks about it in the book of Psalms. The Lord said to my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. It's a position of dominion. It's a position of authority. So don't forget in our sitting we have rest. In our city, we have access, which is important. That's how you can build personal intimacy with God. You can behold His glory. In our city, we have feeding, access to the life of God, the economy of the knowledge of God, right? That is at work on that table. We can latch on it. In our city, we have authority. Inherently, every child of God has authority. Inherently, every child of God has dominion. And then we have power. In Christ, because all that Christ did, He gave us access to it by grace. Somebody say by grace. He gave us access to it by grace. So this is important. We must understand. It. We got access to that table. We did not earn it by works. It was not because you fasted. It was not because you prayed. It was not because you did anything long ago as Jesus was being crucified and he resurrected we resurrected me we were under a spot on the table of Christ on the table of God and as you begin to grow in the knowledge of God and in the knowledge of who you are the economy of that divine life begins to be activated in you now look at what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 is that if then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim out and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. One of the things that your sitting position in Christ with God does is that he affords you an opportunity to latch on to the realities of the resurrected life. If you don't come into this sitting position, you will not be able to maximize the resurrected life. So Colossians 3 1 says, When you have been raised with Christ to a new life by virtue of his resurrection from the dead, he said, You should set your affections on things above. And not on these beneath. The Amplified Classic says, you aim out. You know, the Bible talks about you seeking for the kingdom of God. Unfortunately for many people, when we have access into the kingdom of God, and we say we are born again, the things that we focus on are not spiritual realities, but mundane realities. Mundane realities. For a lot of people, Christ is a means to an end, not an end in himself. We want to use Christ to gain success. We want to use Christ to gain prosperity. We want to use Christ to gain all other things. But that's not the way it works. The way it works is that when you are granted a seat at the table of God in Christ, what God expects that you do is that you now focus 
my daughter will do like this, just a little. You focus on the life of God. You focus on the realities of eternal life. If you then have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, Paul says, aim out. This is the Amplified Classic. And seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is what God wants you to do. You begin to pay attention to the realities. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of who you are is what helps you to maximize the life of God. Because you see, even at this position that you are seated at the table, until you understand what is that divine economy that you are operating in, you will not maximize it. You will not experience it. You will not bring it forth upon the earth. So when you look at Galatians 4 verse 1, he says the heir, for as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a slave. He is still under tutors, but as you know, as you be old and grow into the knowledge of the things that you have access to at that table, that's how you now begin to gain maturity. So it's not enough that you're born as a heir. If you do not grow in knowledge, you do not grow in understanding, you do not have revelation of what you are at that table, then you will not be able to maximize the resurrected life that you have in Christ. You remember the story of the prodigal son. There are two of them. The one that went out and the one that was religious and was at home. At the end of the day, the one that was at home complained and said, Father, you have not as much as strong a party. And the father said, Son, thou art always with me. And all that I have is thine. That is a son who yet did not understand that what the father had was his. It's a place of ignorance. So a person can be seated at the table and yet act as a stranger. A person can be factored into the economy of the divine life as a member of the divine family and yet live like a stranger. He does not come to the table to eat. He does not understand his access, his liberty. He does not, I mean, he, he, even though he's supposed to be able to perceive the things of the kingdom, but he cannot. So the knowledge is critical. When you sit at the table, you understand your spot. The Bible then says you should seek, set your aim at the rich eternal treasures that are above. There are many realities in God that God wants you to experience that are beyond the mundane things of life. This is important. If you look at uh, Galatians chapter 4, Paul was helping the Galatian church to understand their identity in Christ. Making a distinction between those born of the slave woman and those born of the free woman. He said in Galatians 4 verse 31, So brethren, we who are born again are not children of a slave woman, the natural, but of the free, the supernatural. The knowledge of this identity in Christ is critical for you to be able to maximize the resurrected life. Do you know that you are not of the slave woman? That you are the free, you are the supernatural. That he that is from above is above all. That you have dominion over sin. That you have dominion over principalities. That you have been granted the power of God. It is understanding that will make you outstanding. So you sit. It's a position of rest. It's a position of access. It's a position of uh, the knowledge where you have access to the knowledge of God. Where you can behold the glory of God. And you can be changed from glory to glory. The second portion that a believer needs to be conscious of is to stand. After you have been seated, the next thing you will need to come into is standing. You see, the truth is that in Christ, you have been healed, you have been saved, you have been sanctified, you have been perfected, you have dominion over sin. But certain things upon the earth will still come up to challenge the reality of that truth. Facts will come to challenge your truth. And it is only if you're coming to the real knowledge of the truth that you can exercise dominion over facts. Can I, I need to say that to you again. 
The truth is that you have been saved. You have dominion over sin. You've been perfected. You know love. Uh, flesh should not have a position in your life. Dominion over sickness, right? Jesus took our diseases over 2,000 years ago. You are healed in Christ. You are perfected in Christ. You are sanctified in Christ. But you will experience some things which are facts but not the truth. When the symptoms of a sickness shows up in your body, and, and that is not the truth. The truth is that you are healed, but the symptom is a fact in your body. And what the fact is coming to do is to check out whether you actually know the truth. You know, the Bible says, I think John 8, 32, it says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. You are already free. But the knowledge, you see, knowledge is very powerful. The knowledge, I, 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 I used to, uh, when I speak along this line, I used to say the story of the video of a young girl that I saw that was running away from her own shadow. The parents were laughing, but the girl was scared. She was running away frantically from her own shadow. If only she had knowledge, and that comes with some level of growth and maturity, if only she had the knowledge that this was a shadow and it was as harmless as anything, and there was no way she could run away from her shadow because everywhere she went, for as long as light fell on her as an opaque substance, he was going to cast the shadow. It's going to take some level of growth for her to know that. It's going to take some level of growth. So, standing is a position of maturity. It means you're maturing a little bit. You're coming to a point where your light has come. You know, Isaiah says, Arise, shine, for thy light has come. When you enter into the revelation of truth, it begins to empower you to stand. The babies are born and they have to, you know, crawl before the seat. But when you begin to come up to stand, it means that there is a growth that is happening in you. There is a consciousness of your legs. I, I, I show you something in the book of Acts of Apostles. When Peter came to the beautiful gate and saw the guy that was crippled, and then he said to him, Silver and gold I do not have, but that which I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. From the moment he said, rise up and walk, strength and energy was released into that leg for him to walk. But he did not have the consciousness of what has happened. When a child is born, the leg is there. But there is a level of awareness. When the child sees, he's looking at adults who are walking. So life begins to educate the child that your legs are there for you to walk on. Right? Not to sit on. You're, so, I, I told you about Mephibosheth. As Mephibosheth sits at the table and is being fed by the, uh, the, the food that is being served at the king's table, he will come to a point one day he's going to stand up. He, no matter the weakness, the sickness, no matter the handicap that is in your body, the more you sit at the table of God, and you commune with him and you behold his glory, there is a change that occurs and it's a part of growth. Transformation is also growth. You're maturing, you're growing in knowledge. There is an awareness, a consciousness. The proof of life is consciousness. So a child, as he sees other people walking around, is being fed. Energy is coming into the child and then he's conscious that the legs are there for him to walk. One day, he's going to crawl up to something and try to stand. So in this kingdom, the standing portion is a portion of revelation. It's a portion of consciousness. When you are sat at the table, you sit under good teachers. They teach you of the access you have in God. They teach you of the liberty you have in the spirit. They teach you of the realities of the kingdom of God. The things, the finished work of Christ that he has given to you. You will enter into that economy naturally. You will just find yourself standing. Uh, when I left the high school, I was attending a church with my parents. And deliverance was the, the central focus of that ministry. Our dominion over demons was something that was stressed in every every message, every sound. And as a young boy, the more I listened to that senior pastor and general overseer, 
the more I listened to him, my father bought a lot of his tapes. So I was just out of high school waiting to write jam and get ready for the university. I had a lot of time on my hands. I would enter into my father's library, read all manner of books and dominion over the works of darkness, deliverance power and all of that. That was Dr. D.K. Olukoya. I would listen to him. I got baptized in my room, speaking in tongues without anybody. I just listened to him that day and started praying in tongues. So there was this consciousness that the enemy is not so powerful. That was what I got from his messages. I saw him in every sermon, the stories in his book of how he operated in dominion over witches, wizards, and the works of the enemy. And he emphasized that God has given us power and that you can do it yourself. It was after a time of listening to him, I naturally entered into that realm where I could say to demons, go, and they will go. So feeding, again, to the point of sitting, when you sit under something, you will understand it and you will be able to stand. You will be able to stand. To stand is advancement in maturity and it's important to know that you must stand before you can walk. There must be strength in your legs, number one. There must be consciousness in your mind that your legs are for walking and for you to be able to coordinate. Because when you stand, it's also a position of defense. The wind will come against you. Opposition will come against you. Standing is a place of conviction. That's another point. When you stand as a believer, it means you have come to a point where you are convinced of the truth of the word of God. It's a place where you stand in defense. It's a position of defense. Ephesians 6 verse 13. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. So, when you are seated, righteousness, uh, salvation, the gospel, everything that you are taking in becomes an armor that enables you to stand. You put on the old armor until you are put on the old armor of God. Don't stand. If you stand and go to battle, you're going to fumble. And that accounts for why, in, although we had good intentions, we wanted to stand and walk in the victory over sickness, walk in the victory over sin. We found out that the more we try to stand, the more we fail. So you will console yourself with the scripture, the righteous man falls seven times. You know. But if you take your sitting position, there is a process of discipleship. Before you stand and you are commissioned as a member of the army, you must have been trained by God. You will be put under the tutelage of people, right, so that you can be taught the fundamentals of your faith. Your mind can be equipped with the knowledge of the truth. You can become convinced with the things of God. And so that when you stand, diverse doctrines will not be able to pull you down. The wind of the enemy will not be able to pull you down. You'll be able to stand as a warrior in the face of battle because in your sitting position, you have been equipped with the weapons of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. He said, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. So standing is a position of strength. It's a position of the watchman. It means you have got faith. You can't stand in what you don't have. In sitting, you are taking in faith. In standing, you are manifesting faith. Now you are courageous. Now you are strong. Uh, when you read Second Samuel chapter 23 from verse 11 or thereabout, you'll find the story of the mighty men of David. And one or two of them, the Bible talked about how they stood. They stood. You know, for instance, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 12, the Bible says, Shama took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought a great victory. Shama stood. The reason why Shama could stand was because he was strong. He had been trained by David the warrior. You will be able to stand. You have been seated. You have been tutored, discipled. The economy of the life of God has been communicated to you. 
the life of God is activated in you, and then you can start. You took, you take your stand. Shama took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. So when when sickness comes against you, you can strike it down. When oppression comes against you, you can strike it down. When the devil sponsors dreams that are satanic into your life, you can strike it down because you have been grounded. You have taken roots downwards. In sitting, you take roots downwards. In standing, you are beginning to shoot out. So you sit, then you stand. And the third point as we wrap up this morning is that you walk. Hallelujah. You walk. God has called us to walk in the newness of life. To manifest the experience, the reality of the life that we carry on our inside. We are not expected to have it just inside. We are expected to manifest it. Hallelujah. The resurrected life is not something to be behind the scene. It's something to be manifested before people. But the journey to it is that you must first be seated and then take root downwards, understand what it is that God has done for you in Christ, and then you stand, and after you have stood, then you can begin to walk. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Ephesians 2 verse 10. He said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So we were ordained to walk in good works. We were ordained to manifest the life of God. We were ordained to show forth the glory of God. We were ordained to bear the witness of the resurrected life. We were ordained to walk in power. It's a walk. You remember Psalms chapter 1. These three portions are against the portion that you could take on the other side. Blessed is he that does not. But blessed is he that stands here, that walks here, that sits at the table of Christ, that stands in the realities of the things that he has entered into at the table of Christ, but does not just stand, he also walks in it. God wants us to carry the life experientially as a reality to the world, as a testimony to the world, that what the word of God says is true. We can walk in the victory. We can walk. That's how we demonstrate the reality of the victory that Christ has earned for us. We are his workmanship. And we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God has ordained that we should walk in them. We walk in power. We walk in authority. We walk in love. We walk in dominion over sin, over situations and circumstances, over demons and the forces of earth. God wants us to walk in them. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. He said, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. That's Romans chapter 6 verse 4. So there is a newness of life and God wants us to walk in it. So when people, for instance, treat you badly and you reciprocate with love instead of bitterness and hatred, they wonder what kind of man of man you are. But the reason why you are able to manifest that reality is because you are seated, you took a stand, and now you can walk in that newness of life. It's something that is deep. Have you ever looked at the story of uh, the deacon stealing, how that he was being stoned, and yet he said, Father, forgive them. Lay not this sin to their child. That was special. That was, un I mean, unusual. The normal thing that he should do was to cast them out. Cast them out by the anointing. Put a demand upon the grace of God, upon his life. But there was a newness of life. So when you find out that your envy is gone, 
Your jealousy is gone. Your bitterness is gone. You are now gentle. Not because it was your original nature, but because by the walking in the spirit, you are the newness of life is being manifested through you. It's a special work. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. These I say then, walk in the spirit. So it's a walk in the spirit, not a walk in the flesh. Even though we move in the body, but the reality of our walk is that we are not subject to the laws of the body. We are walking under the laws of the spirit. We walk in love, right? We follow peace with men as much as it lies with us. The reasons why we can do that is because of the resurrected life. The law that regulates us is a different law. It makes us to do things by the standard of the kingdom, not by the expectation of the world. You know, in the kingdom, we have a different rule, different set of rules. Our life is guarded by a different set of laws. So we don't just do things. We are not reactors. We act out the intent, the will, and the purpose of God. That's the life of the believer. That's the regenerated life. But he starts from sitting at the table. I believe that this word blessed you this morning. I just do a quick recap. So the resurrected life is a victorious life in Christ. Jesus has done it. But for us to walk in the reality of it, we must first sit with Christ at the table. And he has granted us access. It's a free access by grace. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father. That guarantees us rest. It guarantees us access. It guarantees us liberty. We have access to the life of God that is sat on the table, to the knowledge of God. That's how we take root downwards. We learn. Jesus said, learn of me. There is a learning time. We are disciples, right? And when you sit in that place of victory and you understand that you have a spot at the table, it affects your mentality. And then you begin to stand. After that you have been established on the city, you have strength enough to now stand. You have a conviction, a revelation and knowledge of who you are in God. And then you can begin to walk in the fullness, in the reality, in the experience of the things that have been done for you in Christ. Hallelujah. You can contrast that with Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is he that walk not in the step of the wicked, that stands not in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the company of the scum. The right position is to sit at the table with Christ, to stand in the liberty where with Christ has freed us, and to walk in the newness of life. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah. All right, so that's the end of the teaching this morning, I want you to take time to meditate on the Word of God and take advantage of the knowledge that has been communicated. Find out where you are with respect to the realities of the kingdom life. Are you sitting? Are you standing? Uh, are you already walking? And you know, you can adjust yourself appropriately to the level where you are, God wants us to walk, but we cannot walk if we have not yet sat, we have not yet stood uh, before we come to walk. That's why you have all this falling down and rising up, falling down and rising up. But if the protocol of life is followed, you have sat, you have stood, then it will be easy for you to walk in the newness of that life. Can we bow down our heads and talk to God this morning? And say, Father, help me to walk in the fullest expression of all that you have done for me. Let it become a reality in my life. I want to walk in it.